Today, the nature of inspiration. The nature of inspiration. When we see or hear or read a great piece of artwork, we often say, oh, it's inspired. It's a way of recognizing that the piece of artwork is beyond great talent, but reveals a spirit behind it. We express this by saying, wow, that's inspired. It says that something served as a powerful motivator. It reveals deep emotion being expressed through that piece of artwork. Now, the word inspired means of extraordinary quality, as if arising from some external creative impulse. It means also to infuse into the mind, to communicate to the spirit as divine or supernatural influence. And it means of air or another substance that is breathed in. And people throughout the centuries have been inspired to create music, to create great liter literary pieces, to paint incredible paintings, to sculpt beautiful sculptures. Others have been inspired to explore new worlds, explore our world scientifically, what it's made of and how it works. Others still have been inspired to create new inventions, machines that fly, float, go faster, farther, more efficient. Inventions to make our lives more comfortable, more convenient, like phones, computers, electric lights, and roads. Inspiration seems to be part of what it means to be human. Where does inspiration come from? Is it an innate human quality, or is there an external source, or both? How many of you have ever felt inspired? Anybody? Yeah, I know a number of you have. Can you recall a moment when you have been greatly inspired? Greatly moved to do something, to create something? I always feel inspired to practice my guitar more after I've heard Keith play. <laughs> His musicianship inspires me to practice more to learn new techniques. It's a great external source of motivation and tool of creativity. When I see the incredible architecture of Europe, I feel inspired to create a similar look and feel in my own home. When I see the trim work and home design work of my father-in-law, Rod, I'm inspired to create a similar look in order to produce that same feeling invoked when I look at his work. Inspiration can also come from within. Personally, I find music a wonderful creative tool through which I can express what is going on inside of me. And one of the first things I did after my first experience with Jesus Christ was to write a song. I was inspired. Something had happened to me, to me which I felt I needed to give expression. The Bible was written in the very same fashion. People were inspired to write down events, experiences, expressions, and revelations. And you've heard it said before, the Bible is God's word. My question is, in what sense is it God's word? Does it mean that God dictated every word? I mean, the reality is someone wrote it. God did not reach down with his hand and write the Bible or any book. Yet many people have claimed their writings are from God, and many of those writings differ, even contradict each other. When I became a Christian at the end of high school and went to Bible college, one of my questions was, where did the Bible come from? Hmm? It always bothered me when people said, the Bible is the word of God. And it bothered me because God did not sit down with pen in hand or a laptop on hand to write down his instructions to us. Someone, a person just like you and me, sat down and penned it out. So what makes us think this is from God? I believed the Bible had historical significance, but the word of God really? There was no doubt in my mind that Jesus was real, 
that salvation is found in him, that our connection with God is found through faith in Jesus Christ. And in the midst of this was the question in my mind, what makes you say the Bible is the word of God? First of all, it is important to point out that the Bible was written by over 40 authors over a period of approximately 1,500 years. This isn't one person writing something and then claiming it's from God. The recognition of inspired scripture, which became the Bible, was recognized by groups of people throughout the years, not by individuals at one time in history. And this process of scrutiny still goes on today. Newly discovered historical texts, fragments of the Bible, when found, are scrutinized for accuracy and reliability. Compare this to other religious texts such as the Quran, the Book of Mormon, Scientology, all written by one author claiming divine authority. Also consider the span of time over which the Bible was written. Its inspiration transcends time and cultures. Its unifying message of faith and salvation form a common thread throughout the collection. And what I discovered was that my issues with the Bible as the Word of God had more to do with the nature of inspiration than the claim that God is behind the writing. I do believe God inspired it, absolutely. But my issue had more to do with the nature of this inspiration than the claim that God was behind the writings. So today... I am not going to get into whether the Bible is inspired, for I believe that it is. Rather, the nature of that inspiration. I'm going to start with the presupposition that, is, that it is divinely inspired. I mean, of course, here we are in a church. I, I suspect that the majority of us do recognize God's inspiration behind the Bible. How many of you do believe that the Bible is inspired by God? Anybody here? Yeah. Lots of us, of course. Now, it's okay if you don't. We will deal with that issue another day. Perhaps even today, some of you may move from not believing the Bible is inspired by God to believing it is. One of the biggest hindrances to people accepting the Bible as divinely inspired comes from a misunderstanding of inspiration. Now, some people think that divine inspiration means dictated. This is a literalist interpretation which does not account for contradictions or human limitations that are found in the text. It is easy to reject the Bible as divinely inspired on this basis as there are blatant contradictions and glaring human limitations found in the text. Now, in response to these facts, many people reject the Bible as divinely inspired. Their rejection is not based on the text itself, but on a misunderstanding of what divine inspiration means. So first of all, what does the Bible claim for itself as being from God? There are two key passages that directly deal with this. The most famous is found in 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. New Living Translation. Now, notice with me that it, it does not say it was dictated by God, but rather it is inspired, it says. The writers were inspired by God. How aware they were of this is not known. Do you think that they knew as they wrote that it would become part of a collection of divinely inspired writings? Do you think they knew that as they were writing? I don't think so. I don't think Solomon or David or Asaph thought their songs or writings would become part of a collection known as inspired by God. 
I'm sure they recognized being inspired by their experiences with God, which resulted in expressing this experience in their contemporary forms of art and literature. But I do not think that they sat down thinking, God is going to tell me something to write down, which everyone will recognize from him. And I don't think that Paul, when writing his letters to the different churches, thought that they would comprise the New Testament. He simply saw issues that needed to be addressed and was inspired to address them. People saw the value in what he wrote and circulated his letters among the churches so that everyone could benefit. And I don't think that the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and John, Luke, I don't think that they thought, ooh, I have a divine message which I need to write down for everyone to read. I think they thought, it's important to preserve as best we can the life and teaching of Jesus, and the most efficient and reliable method is to write it down. They were inspired to preserve the record. Then the second most commonly used passage in the Bible used to define inspiration is found in 2 Peter 121, which says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of prophets, but holy people of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. King James Version. Two things to point out here. First, the claim to divine authority and the interpretation of that message is never decided on by one person. It is never decided on by one person. Interpretation, which is a message for another day, is never one person saying, well, this is what it means to me. The intended meaning of the text is always available to everyone. And the second idea of the Holy Spirit moving those who spoke and wrote with divine authority. To be moved is another expression of inspiration. It means to lead or to carry along. This is inspiration from an external force. Has anybody here ever felt moved by something? I'm actually easily moved. I know you find that uh, difficult to believe. But when I watch movies, nine times out of ten, I cry. I do. I, I do. Even my son will lean over on the couch and say, Dad, are you crying? <laughs> no, I just have something in my eye. I'm easily moved. It is a recognition, recognition that there is some powerful motivator, a moving force, driving the message. This is inspiration. Note with me that neither passage says that the text was dictated by God. Nowhere does it say that the Bible is dictated by God. So what exactly is the nature of divine inspiration? Here we have four views which may help clarify what is meant referring to the Bible as being divinely inspired. So these four views are taken from Raymond Brown's book, An Introduction to New Testament. If we could click to the next slide for us there, Cliff. Awesome. Okay, so there's four views of divine inspiration. The first view is the literalist view. God overrode the author's individuality and creativity, this view says. And the words are directly from God and are to be interpreted literally. Hmm. The literalist view on inspiration makes divine inspiration so dominant a factor that the limitations of human writers become irrelevant. The literalist view says the writers became like robots, who wrote out exactly what God programmed them to write. No account for personality, no account for human intention, no account for contextualization. And the literalist view goes on to say, the stress on inspiration is often correlated with a sweeping theory of inerrancy, whereby biblical data relevant to scientific, historical, and religious issues are deemed infallible and unquestionable. Have you ever met anybody like that? <laughs> yes, it's hard to believe that there are some of those people around still today, but it is true. <laughs> In other words, if the Bible says the earth is flat, then it's right, 
Even if all the scientific data in the world says the earth is round, the literalist view of inspiration says the Bible is right. Now, of course, it is easy to see the problems with the literalist view, right? First of all, it's easy to see that the inspired writings of the Bible do not ignore the individuality and creativity of the writers, says Norman Geisler in Christian Apologetics. It's easy to recognize the writings of Paul compared to Luke, compared to Peter, compared to John, as each writer has their own unique writing style. I remember when I started reading the Bible, I went to Bible college and people were debating on, on who wrote the book of Hebrews. People would say, well, Paul wrote it. My first reaction is, no, he didn't. Read the letters of Paul and then read the letter of Hebrews and you can see very clearly Paul did not write Hebrews, the style, was very different. The nature was very different. It is easy to recognize the writings of Paul compared to Luke, compared to Peter, compared to John, as each writer has their own unique style. And this alone shows that divine inspiration did not override the human element of writing. From their writing styles to their target audience, the inclusion and exclusion of information, the arrangement of that information are all seen to be tailored to the personalities of the writers. Secondly, we have all seen the fallacy of the literalist interpretation where the text and science run into each other. Hmm? There was a time when the church insisted that the world was flat. Did you know that? Hmm. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it's true. Then they insisted that the sun revolved around the earth. We talked about that in a number of messages past. Their problem was their understanding of divine inspiration. They had a literalist view of inspiration, which is incredibly flawed. The problem wasn't the text. It was their view on the nature of inspiration. In response to the literalist view, then, two closely related views of inspiration sprung forth. One of those is the pious, the pious view. So in reaction to the literalist view, when they look at the literalist view and go, this is ridiculous, it just doesn't make any sense, they decided to react against that and they threw divine inspiration out altogether. Or they insist on it by ridiculous means. One is the pious theological belief view. The pious view views inspiration it teaches that the inspiration is nothing more than wishful thinking by those who want to believe the text is divinely inspired. It says, oh, this is from God. Based on nothing more than wishful thinking. There's no validity to divine inspiration, this view says. It is simply a human-derived belief. It throws the baby out with the bathwater. It says divinely inspired. It is divinely inspired because people want it to be. Any honest person quickly recognizes the fallacies of the literalist view. And so counteract biblical literalism by debunking any special status for the text. I know many people who have grown up in churches where the literalist view has been presented as the only view on biblical inspiration. And as they began to think for themselves, properly rejected the literalist view, but failed to recognize other theories of inspiration and have taken the position of no inspiration at all within the text. Have you ever met anybody like that? They grew up being told this is literal. And then they realized, hey, wait a minute, this isn't making sense. And the response is to say, well, then this can't be divinely inspired. Well, that's not right. I have, I have a couple of friends who are like that. He said, no, no, the problem is not the text. It's your interpretation, your, your view on the nature of inspiration that is causing you to reject it. Many young people have gone to university having a literalist approach to the Bible, only to have that world torn apart by good reasoning. The fault is not in the text, but in the nature of inspiration ascribed to the text. Their reaction to the debunking of the literalist view is rejection of the text altogether. Then the second reaction to the literalist view is the inappropriate view. The inappropriate view. This view teaches that inspiration 
is an inappropriate designation to the text. It postulates that the fact that both testaments were produced by believers, for believers, and were preserved by believers to encourage belief, no appeal can be made to inspiration. All the claims of inspiration are within its own system, therefore they are invalid. For example, Hinduism claims their scriptures are from God. Islam claims their scriptures are from God. Christians claim their scriptures are from God. Mormons claim their scripture is from God. If the appeal to inspiration is only internal, within a given system of belief, it is inappropriate to designate it as divinely inspired. That's what this view is saying. Unlike the art of Michelangelo, the Mona Lisa, the group of seven, people outside of their individual cloisters recognize it as inspired work of extraordinary quality, right? And to address this point on inspiration, one would have to compare religious texts in order to recognize and or validate the inspirational claims of one to another. But most people don't do that, which is the point of this view on inspiration, which says it's inappropriate. People tend to hold on to one viewpoint, afraid to explore anything else, lest they discover they may be believing in a lie. Personally, I love studying world religions. I took world religions in my undergrad and in my master's program, and I was asked a few times why I would study world religions. I was surprised at the question, but not as surprised as they were to my answer. I said, well, how do you know Christianity is the best religion if you haven't learned what the other religions teach? <laughs> is that too obvious? <laughs> really? <laughs> the inappropriate view calls attention to the groups of people who do not see beyond themselves and therefore claims of inspiration are inappropriate. So, we have two main reactions to the literalist approach to divine inspiration. All three of these fail to adequately represent the biblical text. The last position, the intermediate position, the intermediate view, most accurately represents the biblical text. The intermediate position accepts inspiration, deeming it important for the interpretation of Scripture, but does not think that God's role as an author removed human limitations. Those who wrote were time-conditioned people addressing audiences of their era in the worldview of that period. Although, they, although what they wrote is relevant to future Christian existence, their writing does not necessarily provide ready-made answers for unforeseeable theological and moral issues that would arise in subsequent centuries. Hmm. Does that make sense? Does that sound a lot more accurate, a lot more representative of what we find in the Bible? I think so. This view of divine inspiration reconciles the facts of individual personalities distinguishable between writers, the contextualization of the message, the inclusion of extra-biblical texts, the adaptation of extra-biblical religious and philosophical texts into the scripture, variances between how the authors of the Gospels chose and organized materials which differ from the other Gospel writers. Hmm. I mean, some of you have even mentioned to me how you find the presence of extra-biblical texts in the Scriptures a difficult fact to grapple with. A little bit uneasy, a few of you have mentioned to me. I know, but it's there. Hmm. The problem is our understanding on the nature of inspiration. We've looked at, we've looked at that particular issue from the last few weeks even in the message on Proverbs last week with the inclusion of King Lemuel, a Syrian king. Previously to that, we looked at the influence of, of the um, Jewish philosopher Philo in Hebrews. We looked at the Gnostic language in John. We looked at, in the Psalms, how the Canaanite worship song in Psalm 29 was adopted from the Canaanites into the Psalms. 
We looked at the Babylonian stories of Enuma Elish and the Epic of Gilgamesh and the creation stories of Genesis. God inspired the writers to communicate a message. In so doing, they contextualized the message so the readers would understand it. The idea that the Bible was written in a vacuum is part of the literalist view of inspiration. The literalist view ignores any moving of God outside the Hebrew or Christian religions. Yet God is seen moving among lots of people outside the limited communities of the Hebrews and later Christians. And we looked at some of that movement with Melchizedek and Balaam, Cornelius. Raymond Brown says to this point, he says, no matter how earnestly modern Christians may affirm that they hold nothing except what is found in Scripture, they are so far from the worldview of the biblical authors that they cannot look at spiritual realities the way those authors did. Those authors recognize the moving of God within and without their communities. The biblical authors recognized the moving of God around them and were inspired to use it in their messages as they can communicated their message to their audience. They wrote, inspired by God, not dictated by Him, using their personalities, their creativity, their contemporary art forms, their language, their cultural stories, and storytelling methods, all to communicate something greater than themselves. These are people who had genuine experiences, which they simply recorded. God revealed things to people, which they were inspired to write down. People recognized issues that needed to be addressed and wrote them down. People saw historical events and felt it deeply important to preserve those events. People had a message burning within them and contextualized it in order to reach a specific audience. And in the midst of all this was a broader community of people who had experienced similar things, witnessed the same things, and agreed that God's spirit was behind the writings. Deciding which books belong and which don't is the process of canonization, which we will look at down the road. But even today, as we compare the historical surrounding documents and texts of other religions, it is easy to see which belong as biblical, inspired documents and those that do not. It is because of this recognizable inspiration that these documents were grouped together while others were excluded. And for all of us today, hopefully the nature of this divine inspiration has become clear today and reconciled the textual facts with the presence of God in them. Amen.